Hi, everyone. Welcome to the NYI Universe. Um, hope you enjoyed that little musical introduction that it's possible nobody could understand. I'm not sure. Um, by uh, a wonderful performer called Maggie. More on that later. Um, so this is, as many of you know about NYI, we've um, existed for many, many years in the form of summer schools and more recently winter schools, both in person originally and then virtually. Um, and, but now we are a, a virtual school and, but, but our, what is most important to us is that everything be done live. So this is a live event. This is not asynchronous uh, interaction. This is live synchronous interaction with the beautiful use of Zoom. So we strongly, strongly, strongly encourage everyone to uh, you put your cameras on so we can see each other. It's a beautiful sight. I see a big screen full of faces. Almost all of them are actual people. We don't care what your background is. We don't care what's behind you. Uh, you could be in a basement or a bathroom or on the street, it doesn't make any difference. It's actually quite interesting to see that. So please, please, please you, uh, have your cameras on uh, whenever you can um, so that we can see each other and we really can feel that we are together and we are, we are live. Um, the school has a long history and instead of telling you anything about that history, what I'd like to do right now is share a video. So, uh, which will tell you a little bit about that history. And so please have your headphones or your good sound. Enjoy this video by our phenomenal 
video making queen. Um, and I'm gonna try to do that right now. Uh, do you see gray? Yeah, you see gray. Okay. So here we go. And give me the thumbs up if the sound is good. Okay, Vinny, here we go. How many roads must a man walk down before you call him a man? How many seas must the white dove sing before she sleeps in the sand? Yes, and how Thank you. We will um, thank you to our incredible video maker um, who's here with us somewhere in the background. Uh, we will post the video so you can watch it. I know when you stream it, it, it's a little jumpy, but we will post it so you can enjoy it. Some of those pictures from the old days. Um, now what we're going to do is have the NYI team, the expanded international NYI team introduce themselves. Um, so NYI team, please. Um, Raise your hands. NYI team members, raise your hands. Okay. All right. Um, so now let's uh, let's have everyone introduce themselves. Hi. So my name is Vinny. I'm uh, currently in New York for the weekend. Hello, I'm Yulia. I'm in Belgrade, Serbia. Hi, I'm Masha. I'm in the village of Krasha near Ljubljana. Hi, I'm Anya. I'm in Paris. Hi, I'm Masha. I'm from St. Petersburg. Hi, I'm Anya. I'm in Miller Place, New York. Hi, I'm Sabrina. Uh, I'm in New York. 
Hi, I'm Jian, currently in Ankara. Hi, I'm Ivana in Berlin. Hi, everyone. I'm Deni <laughs> Sorry, I'm Daniil. I'm from Pretoria, South Africa. Hi, everyone. I'm Puru. I'm from Iran, but now I'm currently living in Germany. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Luca. <laughs> Hi, Luca. <laughs> Hi, I'm Go Lucas. Ahead. I'm in Verona, Italy. Hi, I'm Madam, and I teach linguistics in Baltic Sea. <laughs> Hi, I'm Abdurrahman from Delhi. Hi, I'm Luba. I'm currently in Hamburg, Germany. Hi, I'm Fung. I'm calling from Bali, Indonesia. Hi, I'm Dina, and my whereabouts are unknown. <laughs> Hello, Hello, I'm Ludmila. Uh, I'm from Russia. I'm Polly. I think it's my turn. I'm not sure. And I'm in Berlin. And I'm John Fred, and I'm in somewhere near some water on Long Island. And <laughs> so fantastic. Um, there, <laughs> so everyone, we did manage to have everyone who is on the organizational team of MYI introduce themselves and some other people also, which is great. Um, I think we should, uh, you know, like people who have raised their hands who want to introduce themselves, please do. Um, <laughs> we heard from a few, um, but instead, what we, we what we had in mind so that everyone can meet and introduce themselves really quick. Vinny, ready to roll? Um, we are going. We've done this before, but we're going to do a very blitz version of short introductions of the following kind, so people can lower their hands, um, which is. Uh, that we will throw you into groups with two other people and uh, just say hi, maybe say how you got involved in this, how you heard about this, and then we'll close it and you'll come right back, okay? So let's do that. <laughs> We're doing that? Yep, okay. Getting it ready and to when you come back- down, Just creating the room okay. quick. Okay, all right. All right, so I- just launch the rooms and you should be good to hop in. So there should be about three or four per room, so.
Welcome. Welcome back, everyone. Please put your cameras on when you if you if they aren't on when you come back. That was fun. So, okay, I have to tell the story of my group. I have to because this school has existed for in some form or another for 19 years. And there are 100 people at this meeting or something, um, or a little under, and in groups of three that were randomly distributed, Anna Maslnikova and I ended up in the same group. And we started this school together 19 years ago, the two of us in the same group of three. How does that happen? That doesn't happen. And I, Anna didn't even believe that it wasn't a setup but I had to convince her that that was random, that we end up in the same group. Fantastic. Let's do it, Vinny, let's do it one more time, okay? All right. Same thing, just meet people and bring us back even sooner, I think is fine. All right, so I just get off again, some... then there's... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just... Uh, you have to reshuffle the them? Yes. Okay. Uh, Anna, see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> So no predetermined uh, destinations here, all completely random. All right, so after checking, it is confirmed that John and Anya are not in the same room again. <laughs> so. <laughs> I did not get any room, so I don't know what happened, but that's fine. I can, I'm happy to stay here. Yeah, we, we have our own little uh, impromptu room yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's nice to see you all. It's, you yeah, know. yeah, great. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Uh, please put your cameras on so we can see you all in our live, live uh, synchronous tradition that we're trying to maintain that everything is going to happen live. Uh, so uh, let me tell you a little bit. We've never had uh, year round activities that we're starting now at the NYI universe. So um, the, all of you. <clears throat> All of you have uh, probably, there's a two-step procedure. You have to fill out a Google form for us, which probably you have. And the second step is you get an email and you have to register an account on our website. Most of the website is visible to you, but some of it is not. If you haven't uh, made an account, you make an account, you make a password with your own uh, email address, you make your own password, so it's very secure, and then you can have access to the schedule, and the schedule has 
links to the events, to the Zoom events. Um, so this link you were also sent in an email today, but in future events, you will have to register on the website to be able to access the events, okay? Events are going to, uh, for the fall semester, events will be taking place on uh, Saturdays, this time of day, uh, approximately. So if, if there's a complicated issue with time changes, so here in um, the US, the times, the clocks will change in a couple weeks or in a, in a week. Um, I think in some places the clocks are changing tonight. Is that correct? Uh, in, cent in, like in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And then there are places where the clocks don't change at all. So it's very complicated. We will try not to screw it up on the posters and put the wrong times. But basically I can give you um, this rule of thumb. If your clock, I think this is accurate. If your clocks do not change, the Saturday meetings will begin at the same time that they began today. Okay. If your clocks do change, then uh, after one week from two weeks, starting when all clocks have changed in a, in two weeks, then your the meeting will be one hour earlier. So it'll be 10 a.m. in New York and um, and 4 p.m. in Central Europe, etc. Okay. But we will also put it on each poster, and we will try not to blow it. Okay. So um, we will have event every Saturday. Um, and I can tell you some of the upcoming events are posted. Um, you can see them under the NYI Universe tab on the website. There are posters there. So next Saturday at, um, at this time or one hour earlier, if you're in Central and Eastern Europe, I believe, will be a talk about um, Ukraine and uh, visual representations uh, um, in propaganda about uh, the war. And um, from uh, Alina Mozalewska, who is in Germany, but originally from uh, based in Nikolaev in Ukraine. Uh, and then a week after that, on November 12th, it will be the first of the meetings of the Linguistics Frontiers series with, and we will mostly have two or more speakers at many events. This is our idea of short talks and we'll have short talks today in a few minutes um, for our first attempt at short talks. Um, that first event in the Linguistics Frontiers will be uh, uh, November 12th and it'll be Norvin Richards from MIT and Susie Wurmbrandt from uh, the University of Vienna. So um, you'll, you'll, be get, you'll be getting individual invitations to all of these events. Uh, and now we also have two ongoing seminars, which were also called working groups. And for those, I'd like to turn it over to um, some of the organizers of those working groups for a very short uh, introduction to what's going to happen in those groups. So let's start with Adam Chigelniak uh, to tell about the talking about trees group. Adam, are you with us? Yeah. Hi. So my name is Adam and John and I will be uh, sort of running a short so, so a seminar every Wednesday uh, at uh, I think it's the usually 1030 but the first meeting is at 10 a.m and you know the details are kind of not that relevant they'll be shown on the poster uh, the seminar is called talking about trees and we will just essentially discuss various details about architectural design phrase structure so we're going to go through cartography alternatives to cartography x-bar bare phrase it's a very broad topic, uh, but uh, we will concentrate initially on sort of looking at the main theories of, of which are about phrase structure. Then we will also discuss talks in the Linguistics Frontiers uh, series. So any sort of major talk, we will have the seminar debate about that and go more detail about these things. Uh, so stay focused as John and I will be, the first meeting we will me and John will be doing short presentations. Uh, about cartography, alternatives to cartography. This is kind of an offshot of what we were teaching together. And for the for the um, working groups and the seminars, the schedule is slightly different. Um, this group, the the talking about trees group, will be meeting on Wednesdays at um, 10 a.m. New York time. So the first meeting will be one hour earlier than this, or possibly two if you also have a clock change, right? Um, and those will be on Wednesdays every week. 
Okay, and now um, Polly, will you uh, tell us a little bit about the writing against Gershwin? Yes. Um, so the first thing that I would say to everyone is welcome to the Writing Against Borders group. Um, we have been working since last January, in fact. Um, I am only the spokesperson today. We, um, one among a number of organizers of, the, um, of this working group, um, when we come together, on Monday, we'll do a more extensive introduction into what we are about. Um, but what we realized is that we've already been doing a lot of writing about, and um, as we as we view it, against borders. Um, so that that's going to be the focus of this um, of the working group at this point. We also are putting together a library, um, which will be available in the commons and I think maybe John will say more about the NYI commons and what that is um, in which we are compiling scholarly uh, articles and fiction and poetry and also an audio um, audio recordings um, of our work and other people's work so we're excited about that um, and I think that's all I need to say now, but please come um, every Monday at the corresponding <laughs> corresponding time. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> yeah, there's no other way to describe it. It's basically, it, so the, the, let me just tell you about the first meetings. The borders, uh, the Writing Against Borders group will meet, uh, the, will meet the day after tomorrow, Monday the 31st at 10 a.m. New York. And the um, talking about trees will meet on Wednesday at 10 a.m. New York, which may not be what the poster says. So um, we will circulate e emails to everybody and make sure that the times are correctly posted. Okay, um, thank you. Um, now we would like to go into our uh, short talks for today. Uh, so um, I think Polly, it's back to you to introduce our first speaker. So these talks will be, um, about 10 minutes long with a few minutes for discussion after each one. And we have three speakers. So this is the, the um, content part of today's event. And thank you to the speakers for agreeing to do this. Um, they will tell us a little bit about the current and future uh, research and ideas going on in their areas. Holly, take it away. Okay, so I have a few important things to say about Kati Vidlak. Usually I improvise, but I've written these things down because I want, <laughs> I, I, they are important and I want everybody to know these things about Kati. Um, she is one of my personal ideals of a scholar activist. Um, and I, I'd like to cite the words of Sara Ahmed here, who says, who believes in theoretical work that's in touch with the world. And I think this is who Kati is and what she does. Um, she works uh, at the nexus of American studies, queer studies, and feminism. Um, she teaches at the University of Vienna, and she's based in Vienna, but travels afar. She has been most recently in Alaska this past summer. Um, and she also embodies um, a notion that's very important in NYI. This notion originated with Diana Yelicha, who you'll be hearing from next, um, and it is lived experience. So this is a kind of touchstone or cornerstone of NYI. Um, and I just want you to know this and we should all keep this in mind. I think that's all. There, there are many more things I would love to say about Kati, but we want to hear from her, so Kati. Um. Thank you so much, Polly. I feel very flattered um, by this kind introduction. Um, I yeah, I hope I can <clears throat> live up to that. Um, can you all see my screen? Yeah, okay. I will time myself so I will not um, speak too long. Um, 
Yeah, so um, what I wanted to do today was um, give you a, a glimpse of um, the work that I'm doing or the field that I'm working in um, on the Nexus or the, the section with what I do for NYI uh, or what I have been doing in uh, the NYI framework and what I want to continue uh, to contribute there. And um, I think if I have to narrow everything down um, to three words, then it would be um, solidarity, decolonization and dialogue. Um, I have been teaching at NYI since 2016, and uh, often I have co-taught, um, and um, some of the courses that I have taught were on uh, race, gender, uh, and sexuality, often with a, a decidedly political angle, um, often also uh, on the intersection of popular culture, because that's where I'm uh, kind of coming from. Um, and I think the very first um, course that I taught at NYI was on uh, punk rock, which was also um, connected to my PhD um, project. Um, the last thing that I did for NYI was um, curating uh, uh, a kind of a special lecture series together with Polly Gannon and uh, Olga Sasunkevich from the University of Gothenburg. Um, and um, I think this is also where I want to go uh, in the future and where I want to contribute. Um, um, that is uh, inviting people to, to speak on um, decolonization and, and uh, solidarity, uh, because I think that is what we need right now. And that is where uh, cultural studies and, and feminist and queer studies can uh, maybe contribute something, um, yeah, to, um, to cope with the current situation. Um, so um, when I when I say that I come from culture uh, from from feminist studies and from queer studies, what do I mean by that? Um, I tried to like give you in a nutshell a definition of this really broad field. But what it means to to me is um, feminist studies for me is the investigation and deconstruction of patriarchy and the fight for equality for all sexes, that is women and men with an asterisk um, and all others. Um, it is also um, an, an aim to deconstruct white patriarchy um, on the axis of oppression along the lines of uh, race, class, disability and sexuality. Um, and again, if I have to narrow it down on a couple of words, then feminist studies is for me about solidarity, anti-imperialism. I think that's really important at the moment right now, uh, decolonization and internationalism. Um, all right. One second. So um, what is queer studies for me? Um, queer studies foreground and prioritize the experience and representations of uh, lesbian, gays, bisexuals, trans, intersex, and queer people. Um, it's again about the deconstruction of heteronormativity and of compulsory of the compulsory gender binary. Um, and uh, for me personally, um, it's also important that queer studies also fight or deconstruct able-bodiedness, um, which is um, the idea and, and uh, yeah, the norm that able bodies are the norm, which of course always signifies other bodies that are not, that do not fall under these norms as others. Um, and solidarity, anti-imperialism, decolonization, and internationalism are equally important within queer studies. So, and for me, queer studies and feminist studies are really two fields that cannot thought about apart from each other, although they are not the same, of course, but for me, they uh, go together. Um, and uh, one of the last projects that I wanna kind of like highlight here um, and that that was actually realized just a couple of days before um, the war started um, was a special issue of Feminist Kritika, the um, um, a journal on feminist um, studies that's done by um, Olga Blachodnik and um, Maria Majacik, two Ukrainian scholars. Um, 
who work within the, the field of gender and queer studies. Um, and this, this special issue was on solidarity and it brought together um, queer and gender studies scholars from Ukraine and Russia and uh, other places in the world um, and really highlighted um, and here I come to, to one of the foci that I have in my work, highlighted um, ideas about how to do solidarities uh, between the West and the so-called East um, and um, all the places in between. Um, and um, if you are interested in that, and, and uh, what was special about that um, issue was not only that we brought together people from all of the places that I mentioned, but also that we published this issue in three different languages, that is Ukrainian, English, and Russian. So if you're interested in, in this special issue, please just go to the site of Feminist Critique, and I will just post the site also in the chat and um, you can read more about it. I think um, what is important for me to, to mention or what, what kind of like was my takeaway from putting together that special issue was that solidarity um, is not an easy thing. It needs a lot of work and thinking and uh, it has to be queer feminist to, to um, be effective. It has to be anti-imperialist, um, especially when we talk about solidarity between um colonizing countries or imperialist countries like Russia and um countries like Ukraine um it we have to our solidarity has to have an anti-imperialist um yeah background um and and has to cr uh, be critical about the implicit um imperial ideas um, that we all carry in our heads um, and it has to be decolonial and um, I think it also has to be uh, has to consider the history um, of the connection between um, yeah between different nations between different peoples um, and um, yeah so I will leave it there um, so my personal um, I was talking a little bit about the um, um, yeah, broader um, international work that I'm doing um, and my my own research, my own focus within this broader international work is very much connected to an analysis of popular culture. I've already mentioned that's where I'm coming from. Um, and um, one of my, um, yeah, one of my long-term studies was um, how American popular culture specifically um, um, does feminist solidarity. And I looked at Madonna, or um, I also looked at uh, the subculture of Riot Girls, um, the punk um, subculture, um, and how they do solidarity, um, especially with uh, with the case of Pussy Riot. So that was um, in the years uh, 2012, 2013. Um, and um, the result that I um, came to uh, was that often, although this solidarity is really well meant and um, um, and uh, wants to do this, wants to forge these important feminist connections, it often falls into the false logic of original and copy, where people in the West um, think that they are more progressive, that they, their countries are better developed, um, and that um, that um, therefore um, the, the East, so to speak, and in this case it was Russia, has to catch up. And um, I... Um, I I think and and I'm I'm talking here also with with other scholars like Lesia Pagulic um, that this is a colonial logic um, that um, and and a colonial colonial way of knowledge production that has to be critiqued uh, for solidarity to really um, be um, yeah be uh, on an equal. Or, or sees people on an equal level and really like facilitates um, uh, solidarities mm -hmm. in, in a um, 
in the way that we want to. Um, a lot of these solidarities also stabilizes Western hegemony and confirms stereotypes. Um, and um, as a kind of a paradox, I, I realized that this uh, kind of solidarities rather supports uh, Russian imperialist logics because it uh, understands Russia as this like very influential, strong power um, um, rather than deconstructing it and, and saying like, like, oh, um, there's also, um, yeah, there's uh, resistance um, against these logics. So um, I cannot go into detail here, but um, um, I, I want to mention um, what my conclusion was, um, and then I will already end uh, with that, was that we have to look uh, maybe not at the, at the most hegemonic uh, forms of solidarity, that, but that we can learn from more peripheral solidarities, maybe also that were uh, that happened longer ago. Um, so I was looking at African American uh, friendships, uh, African American Soviet friendships, um, and um, solidarity um, that that came from peripheries, and that was maybe also um, that that brought uh, different topics um, to the fore. And that is also where I see um the the future of uh queer feminist uh theory and solidarity um is looking at more peripheral solidarities and one of these examples that i'm looking at right now is how indigenous people in north america um uh, create solidarity projects for Ukrainians um, because they feel a kind of like um, relation to them and a kind of like kinship um, based on the experience of uh, being, um, yeah, um, having to fight for their land. Um, and yeah, I think I will leave it there. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and I think now it's my turn to introduce uh, the next speaker, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's really my honor and my pleasure to introduce um, Diana Jelicza, um to you, who has been um, uh, a lecturer and, and um, yeah, participant uh, in NYI from um, I, I think from the beginning uh, of its existence and. Um, Diana's um, foci, she will talk about them uh, herself, but are um, also in, in feminist and queer theory. So she would have been an equally equipped or maybe even better equipped person to talk about queer and feminist studies. Um, but um, she's also an expert in film studies and in trauma studies. Um, and I think that's the focus that she will talk about um, right now. So I hand it over to you. Diana. Thank you so much, Kati, for your generous introduction and for your wonderful overview of some of the questions that you uh, wrestle with in your work, incredible work, if I may say so, and also your amazing con contributions to the NYI universe now, I guess. Uh, indeed, my name is Diana Yelicha, and I, I've indeed been a part of NYI for many, many years. I actually started out as a student. So Bosnia should be on that list of countries because I, I was a student too before I gra graduated be. to teaching. And I've taught a range of it courses from um, the last one being women in film, film and feminisms, um, uh, cinema power and social change, uh, trauma and cinema, or maybe it was called trauma as a cinema. I'm not sure it was a few years ago. But uh, Kati gave you a little summary of, of some of my areas of research. We have quite a, quite a lot of overlap, which is always wonderful. But today I will be talking about one specific um, um, area of research that I wrestle with. I think that's, that's a good way of uh, describing it. Um, and that is um, uh, the intersections of cinema and trauma. And I actually approach this uh, through an intersectional feminist lens that takes into consideration how traumatic experience is situated at the nexus of gender, sex, race, class, sexuality, ethnicity, and other intersex intersecting nodes of identity. Um, for example, in my book, um, uh, one of my books I've written on post-Yugoslav post-conflict cinema, that's the part of the world that I come from. 
So with those identity nodes in mind, trauma is rendered differently visible or invisible, acknowledged or negated in cinema and beyond. So I'm going to just talk briefly about some definitions. So we are sort of uh, on the same page here. What do we mean by trauma? Trauma is usually described as a psychic wound. Cathy Carruth, um, a preeminent theorist on trauma, uh, psychoanalysis and uh, literary studies, uh, talks about it. Um, and I quote from her, in the most general definition, trauma describes an overwhelming experience of sudden or catastrophic events in which the response to this event occurs in the often delayed, uncontrolled, repetitive appearance of hallucinations and other intrusive phenomena. And Ruth Lays uh, equally has uh, written about trauma as an experience that immerses the victim in the traumatic scene so profoundly that it precludes the kind of specular distance necessary for cognitive knowledge of what had happened, end of quote. This is where we get those descriptions of an out-of-body experience, if you will. Another influential uh, cultural theorist, Lauren Berlant, has written about trauma as ineloquence tackling the question of whether trauma can be adequately rendered through conventional utterances and representations? The answer is usually no. Likewise, trauma has been described, and I engage with this as well, as somehow cinematic, that which cannot be fully experienced and processed within traumatic experiences returns through flashbacks, nightmares, and visuals that haunt. So if trauma is ineloquent and somehow cinematic, is cinema perhaps ideally predisposed to convey said ineloquence by visual anti-conventional narrative means through which the traumatic recall is in many ways typically experienced to begin with. And this brings us to trauma cinema, which broadly can be defined as films that are about traumatic experiences, whether individual or collective or both. So trauma cinema continually wrestles with ineloquence and the inability to fully access the experience. And very importantly, this is something that I explore a lot, trauma cinema becomes a means to bear witness to the pain of others. Of course, none of this takes place in a vacuum. To reference Judith Butler in her book, The Frames of War, whenever there is a frame, something stays outside of that frame. And the unequal distributions of power and visibility typically dictate what gets excluded from these frames. Likewise, the basic unit of cinema is a visual frame. And when it comes to trauma, in each instance of a visual cinematic frame, that which stays outside of it may be more important and more central to the inaccessible aspects of the traumatic experience than that which is contained within it. It's sort of a paradox, if you will. Uh, some people have called it traumatic paradox. I will share my screen because I want to give you an example now. Uh, consider this film, which if you've taken my women in film class, we've watched Quo Vadis Aida uh, by Yasmin Lozhbanic from 2020. It's a Bosnian film. Um, this is a film um, that is a narrative uh, a fictionalized account of true, uh, based on true events. Um, the event uh, in question is the Srebrenica genocide that took place at the end of the Bosnian War in 1995, when uh, Bosnian Serb soldiers um, rounded up the citizens of the town of Srebrenica and its surroundings and systematically uh, executed or more than 8,000 um, men and young boys, Muslim men and young boys. And I think that this fictional character is a survivor as women were because they weren't uh, targeted. It was the men who were targeted. Uh, so Aida survives and loses, sorry for the spoilers. As she, I still strongly advise you watch this film if you haven't. She loses her husband and two sons. This film about systematic killings that refuses to make a graphic spectacle of the massacre and mass death because that experience is inaccessible to the living. We see the events surrounding the killings, but we don't see the actual killings. They're not depicted. It's very clear what is happening, however. Those who perished cannot bear witness to their own death. Were their death to be shown, the films and our own gaze would inadvertently align with the perspective of the only other figures who were present during the killing, and those were the perpetrators. There were no other eyewitnesses to the killings themselves. And Zvanich refuses 
to engage and put us in the position of having to experience the perspective of the perpetrators themselves. So therefore, by making a devastating film about a genocide that focuses not on the graphic depictions of the killings, but rather on the struggle for survival and the unspeakable void left in the aftermath, the film, and I wrote about this, is speaking nearby. And this is a term by Trinti Minha, uh, a very influential post-colonial theorist and filmmaker, who talks about speaking nearby uh, as an ethical practice of bearing witness. It is a form of witnessing that, as she says, is a speaking that reflects on itself and can come very close to a subject without, however, seizing or claiming it. And we can add, uh, without co-opting a subject's trauma. As Susan Sontag writes in Regarding the Pain of Others, that's a lengthy quote, a lengthy sentence actually. Uh, so I have it so you can follow more easily. Um, to set aside the sympathy we extend to others beset by war and murderous politics for a reflection on how our privileges are located on the same map as their suffering and may in ways we might prefer not to imagine, be linked to their suffering as the wealth of some may imply the destitution of others is a task for which the painful stirring images supply only an initial spark. Sontag is mostly discussing photography in this book and in previous book on photography, that's what it's called, as a means to regard or apprehend the pain of others. But at the end of this particular book, she makes a compelling case that in fact film more than photography has the potential to jolt a person seeing it into action. Acts of resistance against wars and suffering of others. Uh, it has to do with duration for her, the duration of experiencing. The, the pain and, and uh, trauma of others. And she says the length of time one is obliged to look, feel. Somewhat prophetically, somewhat prophetically, she um, goes on to say, and I quote from her, no photograph or portfolio of photographs can unfold further and further still, as does the ascent by the Ukrainian director Larisa Shepitko the most affecting film about the sadness of war I know. That's, she, that's her words. And again, I know, I know a lot of you are familiar with this film, but if you're not strongly recommended, and I agree with Sontag here. So I continue to wrestle with these and other related questions as do many scholars at these intersections. As I've written recently, perhaps the question is not how do we watch these films, but how they watch us. To refer to the famous argument by a film theorist Serge Denis. He had the experience um, of a film watching him when he first saw Alan, Alain René's uh, documentary about the horrors of Nazi concentration camps, Night and Fog. He says the dead bodies of Night and Fog and later those in the first frames of Hiroshima Mon Amour by the same director are, are among those things that have watched me more than I have seen them. What he means by this is that such films actively compel us or charge us with the moral imperative to bear witness, but also to consider the ethics of how we do so and what we do in the aftermath of it. That probably is the most important part. So uh, to wrap it all up, I've, I've quoted other people, now I will quote myself. Um, the still potentially unique, as I call it, power of cinema to bear witness is something that needs further reflection, especially in view of the contemporary mediascape, which is very different from one in existence when a film like Night and Night Fog uh, or even Elisaveta Svilova's concentration camp documentary Auschwitz first emerged, uh, people seeing for the first time the horrors of the Holocaust and an obviously unsettled their spectators. And Svilova um, is an amazing Soviet, another Soviet filmmaker and editor um, who documented the Red Army's entrance and freeing of, the, of Auschwitz. And, and that footage was used as evidence in the Nuremberg trials. To continue quoting myself, at the same time, these films were a rare sight uh, at that time, sorry, these films were a rare, rare sight that showed, as Denis puts it, that both the camps were real and that these films were just. Nowadays, graphic depictions of suffering proliferate, overwhelm, and oversaturate 
the ever-expanding mediascape at the risk of triggering affective numbness in the spectators. And what is more, cameras and screens themselves increasingly serve as impersonal weapons of mass death when they're, for example, used uh, um, in the form of unmanned deadly drone strikes. End of quoting myself. So frames, screens, and camera lenses are never neutral, nor is their relationship to the traumas of others. Finally, what of those traumas which cannot be told because those who systematically suffered them were not even deemed human and nor their pain pain as a result. Saidia Hartman, a very prominent uh, uh, theorist of in African-American studies talks about this with regards to the, what she calls annihilating violence of the slave, slave ship. The loss of stories sharpens the hunger for them. So it is tempting to fill in the gaps and to provide closure where there is none, to create a space for mourning where, there, where it is prohibited, to fabricate a witness to a death not much noticed. So how to do this? She talks about this, is her term, critical fabulation. And critical fabulation is straining against the limits of the archive to write a cultural history of the captive. And at the same time, enacting the impossibility of representing the lives of the captives precisely through the process of narration. This is the example of Zora Neale Hurston doing one such thing, uh, but also documenting um, against the impossibility sometimes of documenting. Um, this book of hers came out four years ago, even though she wrote it in uh, the 1920s. Apparently, she could, no one would publish it for however a number of decades. Um, she interviewed in this book, she, because she, other than writing fiction, um, she, um, she did ethnographic work. She interviewed Kujo Kusula Lewis, who was one of the last survivors from the last slave ship that arrived to American shores, the Clotilda, and uh, uh, its last trip was in 1890. He lived to see the end of slavery. He lived a long life, and Zora Neale Hurston interviewed him extensively in 1927 and 28. And this is in the book. Uh, it's written in a very interesting vernacular of how he spoke. Um, she refused to, and there was pressure for her to correct this, correct, quote unquote, she refused, and this is how the book is published now. And below still is actually from her ethnographic film. She made ethnographic films um, uh, documenting the rural community that she comes from, where he lived, African-American uh, commu rural community in Florida. So this, uh, from her field work, is the only known film footage of an African person who arrived to America on a slave ship. So she is documenting um, and wrestling with that critical fabulation of not ever uh, being able to fully access some of these traumas. So I continue to believe in the potential of cinema to bear witness to the traumas of others, whether it is critically fabulating or documenting or both. Even if the stories of suffering are unreachable, we must fabricate ourselves as witnesses to them whether they be the traumas from the times that predate us or happening as we speak. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I think I am now turning it over to John, who will introduce Jay, yes? Well, uh, yeah, so, uh, but we, we didn't, um, thank you so much, Bakati and Diana. Do you want to do um, some questions and discussion of your two? Uh, talks first or should we, um, we didn't actually have a plan for that or should we wait and do them all after all three? How do you feel about that, Katya and Diana? After all three? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Um, so thank you. And now um, uh, for our final short talk in this session, um, I will not introduce Jay because what I'd like to do is introduce my mother. Uh, who will introduce Jay Kaiser? Mom? Well, yes, it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Samuel J. Kaiser. There are so many things I could say about him, but I'll say just a few. He's a renowned linguist. He's an exceptionally knowledgeable humanist. He's a beautiful writer, and he's an avid trombone player. And I must tell you 
that his avant-garde trombone group has won awards, which shows how innovative and exceptional they are. So Jay, it's on you now. Thank you so much, Lottie. I think it's going to be downhill from now. <laughs> what a delightful surprise. John, thank you for doing that. And Lottie, you look beautiful. I'm so happy to see you. All right, so can everybody hear me? All right, so I'm uh, going to uh, talk a little bit about the cognitive science and the arts. My focus is going to be much narrower than the uh, uh, very large uh, sort of world scope that of the two speakers before me. So I hope you will bear with me. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, certain aspects of, uh, of Western art. And for that, you'll have to forgive me because it's really the only art that I know well. For those of you who come from other cultures, and I wish I did as well. Uh, from those of you who come from other cultures, uh, perhaps you can take this as an example on how you might want to think about the art forms that have arisen in your own culture. Okay, so having said that, uh, I'd like to begin with the idea that you cannot create art without constraints. Stravinsky, in his uh, Norton lectures, published under the title uh, the Poetics of Music in the Form of Six Lessons, uh, Harvard University in 1947, put it this way. He said, in art as in everything else, one can build only upon a resisting foundation. Whatever diminishes constraint diminishes strength. The more constraints one imposes, the more one frees oneself of the chains that shackle the spirit. So his point was that art requires constraints and in my view, I've been asked to talk about the near future of cognitive science and the arts. In my view, the near future of cognitive science and the arts should be focused on a very simple notion, namely that art requires constraints. The constraints that art imposes are based upon natural predilections of the brain. So I will take the human response to repetition as one of these predilections. And in what follows, I'm going to discuss repetition in the arts. My hypothesis is that the human brain finds repetition pleasurable. Over the centuries, poetry, painting, and music have, in Darwinian fashion, adapted themselves to cater to this predilection. Now, it was the abandonment of this connection that led to modernism. And I've written about that in a book called The Mental Life of Modernism, and I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, what I'm interested in is looking at one constraint, repetition, and its cognitive basis. The predilection that repetition produces pleasure uh, was demonstrated, I thought, in a stunning fashion by Elizabeth Margulis in her book uh, in 2014 called On Repeat. Um, essentially what she did was she took some pieces of music by Luciano Berrio and Elliot Carter and she doctored them. She cut and pasted the parts of the music and put it later on in the music. In other words, she used a computer to mutilate a piece of music that had been composed by some of the world's great composers uh, of atonal music, Berio and Carter. And then what she did was she played this music that she doctored uh, to two kinds of audiences, a sophisticated and an unsophisticated audience. And here's what she says. Listeners rated the immediate and delayed repetition versions. And what she means by that is, in one case, she put the cut and pasted part right after its original source. So you got it following immediately, or else she put it several segments down the line, several milliseconds down the line. Well, not more than milliseconds, seconds, maybe even 
maybe even 10 seconds away or 20 or 30. Um, listeners rated the immediate and delayed repetition versions as reliably more enjoyable, more interesting, and more likely to have been composed by a human artist rather than generated randomly by a computer. Even Mount Roomfuls of PhD holding music theorists, when presented these examples at a meeting of the Society for Music Theory, an audience sympathetic to Berio and Carter, if ever there were one, confessed to finding the rep repetitive versions more likable on first pass. This is a stunning finding, she says, particularly as the original versions were crafted by internationally renowned composers and the preferred repeated versions were created by brute stimulus manipulation without regard to artistic quality. From this, she concludes the following, which I consider is a takeaway from all of this, so I'll read it slowly. The simple introduction of repetition independent of musical aims or principles, elevated people's enjoyment, interest, and judgments of artistry. This suggests that repetition is a powerful and often under-acknowledged aesthetic operative. Okay. That I take as a, a remarkable demonstration about this link between pleasure and repetition. Interestingly enough, when I've read about repetition throughout uh, history, um, let's say starting with Kant and his critique of um, aesthetic judgment, nobody ever talk, they talk about repetition, but they never talk about pleasure. They never link the two, which is, a, I, I think, a remarkable thing, but that's something else. Now, where else do we observe rep, uh, repetition? For one thing, it occurs in rhyme an attribute of English poetry for well over a thousand years. Where else? Well, in meter, of course. Meter is a systematic repetition of the linguistic givens of a language within strict confines of a set of rules. Where else? Heinrich Schenker, the great Austrian musical theoretician of the 19th and 20th centuries, once observed, our understanding of musical technique would have advanced much further if only someone had asked where, when, and how did music first develop its most striking and distinctive characteristic repetition? And Peter Kivy in his 1993 Fine Arts of Repetition observes, the Western tonal classical music, which I have been discussing, does not merely contain repetition as, a, uh, as, a, as an important feature, but as a defining feature. All right. Where else do we find repetition? Well, biblical parallelism, the use of parallel structures as part of the poetic arsenal of the Bible, a rhetorical style which repeats various constituents. Um, Kugel, in the idea of uh, biblical poetry, 1981, illustrates the device with the beginning of the 94th Psalm, and I'll use the English translation, of course, God of retribution, Lord, Lord of retribution, retribution appear, rise up earth's ruler, give the arrogant their due. How long shall the wicked lord, how long shall the wicked rejoice? They brag, speak arrogance, all the evildoers do act haughtily. There, there is a common element in the first verse, it's the repetition, repetition of God of repetition, of retribution. In the second half begins with two imperatives, rise up and give. The third repeats the phrase, how long shall we uh, shall the wicked. You find this kind of thing in modern uh, rhetoric all the time. Uh, remember uh, Martin Luther's King, I have a dream speech, in which I have a dream is repeated over and over. Or then there's Churchill's, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. This repetition of we shall fight, we shall fight, we shall fight, we find pleasurable. We can't help it, it's built into us. So this raises an interesting question. It is obvious that pleasure is associated with reproduction and one doesn't have to think very hard to come up with reasons why that might be so from an evolutionary point of view. Nature wants to contribute to the gene pool so she entices the contributors by making the act of reproduction pleasurable. It's obviously uh, worked. 
But why should pleasure be associated with repetition? What's going on there? What function does it perform in the cognitive structure of Homo sapiens? Because from an examination of art forms, it is perfectly clear that it does. And so from my point of view, the near future of cognitive science is to examine from the point of view of art the constraints that artists impose and then try to understand the, envir the cognitive environment of the human brain, which makes them work. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Katya and Diana. And I guess that the plan is now is, <clears throat> although our short talks are on different areas, that's part of the idea of what we're doing here is bringing these things together. So I think what we want to do now is open it up to questions and discussion about any of the talks. Um, so if you'd like to say, and of course, the chat box is always open um, for if people prefer that medium, but we're not going to check the chat box for questions to be spoken out. Um, we have about 10 minutes. It's not much, but we're just getting started in the, the new NYI. So please raise your little electronic hand um, <laughs> if you would like to co comment or ask anything of the three speakers. And three speakers are welcome to ask or comment upon each other um, as well. And um, the floor, so to speak, is open. Polly, and I won't call on people you see, you'll see when you pop up, so please. Um, yes, I just have a short comment for Samuel. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for your talk. Um, and second, I'm just thrilled to hear your views on repetition, because this is always the way <clears throat> I start every seminar about um, poetry. And I just want to ask whether you might, whether you think that the first experience of repetition we have might be that of the heartbeat, our own and our mother's. I missed that, whether it might be part of what? Our, whether, whether our first experience of repetition might not be the heartbeat, the heartbeat, oh, I, our own and our mother's, yeah. Uh, I see. Well, of course, that's, uh, not, uh, that's a, a very old idea. And uh, uh, it, it also relates to uh, tempo and music, uh, that the need for tempo comes from the uh, heartbeat. Frankly, I haven't a clue. I, I don't, I just don't know. I mean, that's really why I talked about this, because I wanted to say that we don't know, and it would be very nice to construct some sort of a, uh, uh, research project which would explore it. For example, um, what does repetition do for us? Well, it's quite possible that repetition is simply a form of imitation. That is to say, if you imitate somebody, you have created a repetition. And it may be that evolution has decided that having creatures imitate one another is the best way for them as a group to survive. I have no idea. I mean, that's a just so story, but it's an idea. That's one possible, that, that, hence, let's, Mother Nature says, let's make repetition pleasurable so that the creatures will imitate one another. There's another possibility. Maybe repetition is a way in which you learn. So for example, there's a very well-known phenomenon called uh, structural priming. And this is, a, a, I'll, I'll describe this to you because it's an experiment you can conduct with your friends and not tell them that you're doing it. And then afterwards amuse them with the fact that you have in fact done it. And this is the experiment. What you do is you use a particular construction in your language as you talk to them and you observe if they don't in fact answer you 
using the same construction. So there has been evidence that shows if uh, you use the passive construction in talking to a convert, uh, uh, someone that you're conversing with, that person will reply in the passive. Well, that's repetition. Well, what's the repetition? Well, in order to use the passive, you have to have an abstract representation in your mind, which essentially corresponds to the structure of that statement. Well, what you're doing when you talk to somebody is you're making them produce the same. So there's a repetition going on between the two of you. Now, maybe, and, and what that repetition could in fact be, the reason why it's pleasurable is that it forces children to learn language. Now, why would you want to learn language? Well, language is the is simply the outer representation of one of the most remarkable things ever to have come down the evolutionary pike. And I'm talking about the human imagination. Our mental ability to come up with an, a myriad of incredible ideas is reflected in the paltry filter of language. But there it is. And so if I can connect what I, what, what I do with what the speakers have done before, I will say every time you kill somebody, you destroy a miracle. But because there are so many of us, we think it's cheap. It's not. I wouldn't be surprised if the creation of the human mind is the most remarkable thing in the universe. Well, that's probably more than I, more than you bargained for. Wong, please. Uh, thank you, professors, for on your presentation. I want to ask Diana about um, her presentation. Um, there's a theme that you mentioned about the genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina that we see mostly the perpetrator's viewpoint rather than the victim's viewpoint. So this reminds me of a lot of American film about war, like Afghanistan war or Vietnam war, where most of the view that audience entertainment or historical or documentary are from the American side, which means the perpetrator side. Is it a way to, to silence the voice of the victims? Is there any way to counterattack this narrative in film? Because film is a like huge money production where a lot of victims never have a chance to raise their voice. Thank you so much for your question. And I have to tell you, actually, for Quo Vadisaida, the film I mentioned, it's the opposite. The film refuses to engage with the perpetrator's point of view. They're they're depicted, but we are firmly in the point of view mostly of the protagonist, Aida. So we see what she can see and she can see the killings. They're not depicted. There's two scenes that are exceptions to this, two scenes that she's not in. If you watch the film, watch out for them. Um, but I will agree with you on your point that in the dominant uh, um, uh, framework of dominant cinemas and uh, when it comes to, for example, war films, American war films, Vietnam war films, for example, we absolutely get the perspective, maybe some, someone would say, well, that's logical, it's an American film, the perspective of American soldiers, et cetera. But there is no, in the, some of the most iconic films on the Vietnam War, there's absolutely no, um, even, even um, a, a nod, even a, a gesture towards a different point of view than an American and an American soldier's point of view. Case in point, just a quick example. Um, one of the uh, best known uh, films about uh, the Vietnam War and one of the most celebrated, Apocalypse Now by Francis Ford Coppola from 1979, which is generally considered a masterpiece. Um, and it is an important film in the history of cinema and the history of war cinema. I have deep ethical issues with. Uh, because not just because it engages completely in one sided point of view, but also because it makes war aesthetically stunning. 
the, the cinematography in that film is broadly celebrated. It's, everything looks incredibly beautiful and wars are not beautiful. Um, there's a famous sequence um, where the helicopters are arriving to drop napalm on a little village. And that line that everyone loves to quote, I love the smell of napalm in the morning is in that scene. And as these American helicopters are arriving for the soldiers to, to drop napalm, we see on the ground from this bird's eye point of view, the scarring of the villagers, including little children being hopelessly trying to find a place uh, uh, where they would be safe. And we know that that obviously is not going to happen. And, uh, and that's it. That's the extent to which we see the other side. We see them as just running around on the ground from this very privileged bird's eye point of view for of the perpetrators who are about to drop a, a napalm on civilians. So cinema is full of that and we indeed need to raise voices and give platform to, uh, to people whose experiences have not traditionally been shown. And this is what Yasmin Lozvanic, time and again, the director of Kova Adiseida does in her work, both, both documentary work and a narrative film work. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, thank you. We have, so Ludmila, one, in one second, we're going to go to you. Um, and we have only a few, we're supposed to end by 1230. It's just 1230 here in New York. So um, I'm glad that there's so much interest in all of this. We will post the slides of the presentations. Um, we will be, so this is the last thing to say, and then we'll go to the question. We will be sending you information about upcoming events. The seminars begin Monday and Wednesday of next week. Next Saturday is the event about re visual representation in propaganda in the in the um, the on both sides the 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 visual representations by Alina um, Mozalevska uh, about the the war in Ukraine. And um, people are welcome to stay. We're going to have a little music at the end, but let's go to um, Ludmila now. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> oh, thank you so much. So um, I'd like to ask um, uh, Samuel about repetition. And uh, thank you so much for your, uh, for your report. It was so interesting. So um, I have a question about um, repetition and plagiarism. Where does repetition end and where does plagiarism begin? How to uh, make a difference between uh, it and how to deal with it? Uh, uh, between prep, uh, but the difference between repetition and what, please? Uh, plagiarism. Oh, plagiarism. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, oh my. Uh, I think in, that in one uh, minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, I think no, I would it, have to, the intention of the two are really quite different, right? I mean, plagiarism is an act of deceit. But I'm looking at plagiar. I'm looking at repetition uh, intended to e extract pleasure. So I wouldn't consider plagiarism an art. Uh, there may well be uh, points of uh, commonality, namely the fact that they are identical. But uh, uh, it's the context in which the uh, repetition is occurring that interests me. Uh, in that regard, for example, you find rhyme where you can rhyme ham and spam. And you also find Duke Ellington's uh, Satin Doll, in which you find that the first, the, 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 the third and fourth measure essentially rhyme with the first and second measure. They're exactly the same, except. And so you, you find what interests me is that you find rhyme in poetry and rhyme in jazz. And it's exactly the same thing. It's just repetition of a different kind. Now, I wouldn't call that between the, the first and second and the third and fourth measures, plagiarism. Can I, I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Can I Thank quickly you. interject? I just yeah. have a, yes, a, just a quick, Diana, a quick question for Kati. Um, um, uh, again, we have so many overlaps and so, so many interesting things and, uh, and we both included, included some elements of the African-American experience. And I wanted to ask you more about that specifically. You talk, you talk about it historically during the Soviet Union. Uh, do you trace any of that continuation to this day uh, of certain kinds of activism within African-American communities 
and vice versa you know, in, on the Eastern side, I guess, uh, former Soviet Union as continuation of, of, um, of pushing against these dichotomies um, and against the imperialist politics of both of these countries or former countries. Um, thank you for that question, um, Diana. Yeah, I am. Um, um... So the, the examples that I showed on my slides and I didn't have time to, to get into them uh, was um, um, I was particularly interested of seeing how feminists like um, Louis Thompson Patterson, who was on one slide, um, and Langston Hughes, um, Louis Thompson Patterson was a, a, a very... Um, um, yeah, active activist uh, engaged in feminist politics, but she um, she was not a feminist before she went to Soviet the Soviet uh, Union and Soviet Central Asia, and engaged with feminists, especially in Uzbekistan, for example. Um, she became a feminist there, so um, that um, that was for me very enlightening and very um, interesting, and speaks very much against this idea that we have in our heads that. You know everything good everything progressive comes from the west and um um in this case so it it was the uh, the other way around and i thought that okay this is an interesting engagement um and i'm also interested in langston hughes he's not because he was a feminist he probably wasn't but because he was um a gay man who was very much interested in um other ways of um relationships and in engagement um, and he found quite a lot of interesting um, connections in uh, Soviet Central Asia so um, and um, I thought um, this perspective is especially interesting because it comes not from the center of Western politics not from the powerful position but from the per periphery so in how far is this um, is there a continuation? It's not an easy um, question. It's not easy um, to answer that question, but I think there are some continuations, although they might be not um, very aware of their tradition, um, but especially during the um, Black Lives Matter um, movement uh, when in the US, um, Russian activists or Russian um, yeah, I don't know, Instagram, um, 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 people who are on Instagram started talking about um, um, not only solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement, but also uh, started talking about their own situation and, and started making connections and building alliances, especially through new media. Um, and I think you could argue that these are in the tradition of... Um, this um, African American Soviet friendship, um, but maybe not very aware um, of this tradition. Um, yeah, I I don't have any um, better examples, and maybe there are people who are living this tradition more in the more aware, um, um, yeah, state <laughs> of mind. But um, but I, I I'm not aware of them. Um, but I think I see the connections um, and and the uh, yeah building on this this engagement um, through in this Black Lives Matter discussions. Thank you, and of course, there's Paul Robeson, but and also famously Angela Davis, who was a feminist uh, activist and and socialist. I, I, she went to Soviet Union too, I think, but definitely went to Bulgaria she, and very yeah. iconic and legendary visit to Bulgaria, where uh, I mean it was well documented and the kinds of conversations had between feminists from these places that are considered polar, polar opposites, but then also for, uh, an African-American woman who was at, at some point labeled the most dangerous woman in America, right? So that was, um, that, that's very, very important. Yeah. And even, even if, if the, if the uh, political, I would say political stances in support uh, or statements in support of Black Lives Matter by uh, people in Russia or Eastern Europe more broadly, don't necessarily, are not aware of this history of the tradition, they still, continue it in important ways. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the connection, maybe to clarify the connection uh, between those Instagram posters, uh, uh, Instagram uh, activists and, and the, the older friendships is because there are, of course, Black um, Russians, for example, right? And it was um, um, Black Russians who started 
um, posting in solidarity with um, with people in the U.S. and talking about their experiences. And of course, they are um, in a lot of ways um, descendants of of these um, friendships. Um, and um, sometimes, yeah, and and I, I think, yeah, there would be so much more to talk about it. I think a much more, um, I think a, a movement that is much more aware of its own history um, uh, is, is in Germany, um, um, in, in Eastern Germany, or what is now like, of course, um, all of Germany, but but the, the connection between Audre Lorde and people in Germany. Um, um, is it, the movement there is much more, um, yeah, aware and celebrates uh, these these connections that um, that have to, that also have to do with the, um, yeah, Soviet um, anti-racist sense um, and the the GDR anti-racist sense. Thank you. I think that. Um... There's a couple of things that we can say in, in conclusion. One is that um, short talks are good, but it's also good to have lots of time for discussion and questions. And um, so, you know, we it's this balance, and um, all of all three of the talks generated a lot of discussion. I know there's a couple of questions in the chat also. So, what we're going to try to do this fits in with um, an idea that we have, which is to try to keep these discussions going. Uh, in the NYI Commons. The NYI Commons is what we used to call the NYI Social, um, which everyone will get, a, get information about if you don't know. And we will post maybe, I think the best thing to do is to post the three slides there and maybe some of the comments from the chats and start a thread on all of these. And of course they intersect as this discussion now <clears throat> has shown. And so we will try to keep it alive in the comments and everybody who's here and or who, who is interested should, should feel free to contribute to that, keep the dialogue going there. And then some of these themes may turn into um, for future events um, that would be of interest to focus on things that came up here that we would want to uh, spend more time on and get to hear from more people about. Um, so that's also something that we are hoping will happen. So um, very uh, grateful to everybody for coming today and for launching us into the universe and for having these discussions. Uh, which, as I say, are just beginning. They're not ending, although we are about to be ending for today. <laughs> um, so what we always do in these events is have a little music at the end. Um, people feel free to stay and listen to a couple songs if you'd like to. And um, we will send you information about our future events. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and... Okay, tell me if you can hear this. Здравствуй, новый день. Такого еще не было прежде. Если ты куда-то собрался, семь раз отрежь и отми. На лестничной клетке уже стоят спецодежды. Не выходи из-за